Welcome to this sports playbook where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Catherine Noor. Today's guest is Sandhya Manjanath, joining us from Bangalore, India. Sandhya is the founder of Atsi and other sports ventures in India. Today, we're going to discuss basketball in India. All right, welcome, Sandhya. Hi, Kathleen. How are you? Fantastic. Okay, so tell us about Atsi. Um, I would start with the name Atsi. Each letter of the name stands for a whole sentence, and that is Awaken the Sportsman in You. Um, so that's a company I founded in 2016. Um, I saw the necessity for a company like that in India, and then just we went from there with the flow. All right. So you are uh, a young entrepreneur. How old were you when you started your company? Um, okay. Before I started Atsi, I had a couple of multiple pilot projects. So if you go back to the very first one that, that I started, I think I was 17 years old. And then uh, I kept moving up the ladder from there, working, reworking, deleting some ideas and just putting this whole axi together. When I when I had a solid uh, uh, business outline for Atsi, I think I was 23. Okay, so what does Atsi do? So um, Atsi is a a unique company for the Indian market where we go into uh, schools and uh, provide physical education, but for professional development, which means in India, how things work is um, we get about an hour to two in an entire week for kids to play. And this is at the school level, right? So what Atsi does is we work with the schools and in that one or two hours, we send more than just one physical education teacher. Uh, we replace that physical education teacher with multiple coaches. So the student is actually getting a professional sports training in those uh, one or two hours. And then once the student experiences multiple sports, they have a chance to pick which one they want to prioritize. And then they take it forward from there. So we are an external um, vendor, service vendor, I would call, who goes into uh, public and private schools and provide professional coaching uh, events and other activities for kids. Same time, but extra extra education in terms of sports. So what sports do you cover? I know you cover basketball. Are there other sports that you cover as well? Yes, we, we've done in the past. It depends on what infrastructure the existing school has, which means our client, which is the schools. Uh, it depends on what infrastructure uh, they have. Um, but so far, we've uh, coached these many. We've coached basketball, football, uh, cricket, badminton, archery, fencing, uh, swimming, and uh, we've also worked a little bit with cross-country running. So when, when you say football, you're talking about soccer. Soccer. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we have to make that distinction for our American audience. Um, yep, uh, yep. Okay, so um, have you run into any challenges in terms of safety or risk management challenges in um, having those um, instructors go into the schools? Well, absolutely, yes. Uh, more than just a little bit of challenges, I would say. Because uh, like I stated earlier, ATSI is a unique uh, sport management platform for the market itself. So when we initially started, uh, people did not see what we were doing because especially in sports, it takes time for any results, right? So they were like, what are you all doing? This is just too much, blah, blah, blah. So it started off like that. But the, the real challenges stepped in a couple of years later where the weather was taking a huge hit. I don't know if you know this, but basketball in India is still an outdoor sport. 
So the web, all these sports that I just mentioned are pretty much outdoor sports. So if you want to teach archery in an open space, you can imagine, right? Basketball on a cemented floor, uh, you can imagine. So some of those uh, simple challenges for the student side of it is the shoes get torn like way earlier because they play on cemented floor versus and wooden flooring right and uh, also that access to purchase of basketball shoes they have to either get it imported or wait for somebody to travel down who can bring them shoes from a country where basketball shoes are more common and or buy it online because if you walk into a st shoe store in india you're not going to buy, uh, find a pair of basketball shoes that easy. So these are some of the challenges that we as a company also had to address because if we are a professionally player development company, then we also have to facilitate these other drawbacks that we are facing because of absence of those products in the market. I just gave you a small example of basketball okay. shoes, but it also means uh, finding the right basketball. As simple as that, or finding uh, the right soccer shoes or finding the right badminton rackets. So those were some of the uh, teeny mini challenges that I was telling. But again, the huger challenge was when COVID hit. Schools closed, COVID hit, and, and uh, my coaches, like how do you, I had to train my coaches to teach sports online. Mm. like like this like how we are talking right so imagine coaches sitting and looking into a computer trying to teach a kid how to dribble the basketball uh, and we did it and honestly speaking we did it my coaches picked up pretty fast uh, and then we were able to train about uh, three times more kids than we could do in person online because this time my market was across India so I had students from multiple places log in on a computer and, uh, you know, get those trainings from coaches. Um, um, we had a 100-day record where we coached everyday basketball online. So um, those are some of the things that uh, I take pride in, but also when it came to decision-making, it wasn't that easy, especially when you're a, an entrepreneur of a youth unique company in a country that sees sports as just recreation and nothing professional. So you mentioned a challenge with weather. I would imagine that heat is a big issue. And then you would also have times that there was rain and wind. Uh, how do you deal with those issues? Well, a good example is today I had to call off class. Uh, so when I'm in India, I still go out there and be a part of the coaching programs and just be out there. So uh, we had to call it off because it rained heavily here in the place I live, Bengaluru, India. But uh, some of the um, ways that we deal with it is uh, we have a covered spacing, which is like a, a hall where people can sit and do yoga, meditation, a lot more stretching. And so we kind of use that space during our rainy days to improve our flexibility, our body control and all those things, uh, which we cannot pull out time for when we are actually on the court or on the field, right? So we, we use those. Um, and also uh, we do kind of work with weather prediction, but honestly speaking, it's not very accurate, like how it's in the state. So it says it's going to rain, it doesn't. It says it won't rain and it pours. Um, so the weather has always surprised me that way. So, okay, you have quite a social media presence to your athletes. Let's show some of your um, posts that mm -hmm. uh, now, and, and I noticed that a lot of them are about stretching. Mm -hmm. And see, tell us about why you focus on stretching and why you provide these social media posts that are like kind of inspirational to your, um, to the kids. Yeah, so uh, this goes back into my ATSI employees being extra creative because um, there are times where you communicate with the kids a little too much in your 120-minute session and how do you leave 
the leave a mark in their brain about what you taught so then my social media team came up with this idea saying hey we will use the picture of the person and then put out put some quotes out so the next day in practice the coaches can question about what was the post uh talking about yesterday on social media so you know these this generation is more of uh um social media people versus listening to their teachers or coaches or parents and so we use that uh, uh social media presence of our athletes to our advantage by teaching them what they really need to learn in, in a little bit creative way i would say all right so now you are i know you are an excellent basketball player and have a rich history in playing basketball tell us about that okay so um I, I initially started being an athlete. I was a long distance runner, 1500 meters, 3000 meters runner uh, back in school. And then I moved to being a swimmer for a little bit. And then at one of our uh, school sports days, uh, the chief guest, which is my first basketball coach, uh, identified uh, me, my speed, my flexibility. I don't know what he saw in me. He just said, hey, you should be a basketball player. You'll do good in it. And so I just gave it a shot and uh, rest is history. So I started there and then I was 13 years old. Um, in the very first year, I represented my state at the national level. The very first year, like eight months into picking up a basketball, I was already wearing my state, which is Karnataka jersey, and I was representing uh, my state at the national level. So that way, um, that was my small start. Uh, and then um, from there, uh, I've played for this club called Beagles for about... 16 years now and the last trophy I lifted was recently in 2017 so um, anytime I get a chance I still go back and play uh, I'm hoping I get to play sometime this season as well while I'm here in India so um, I've played about 35 uh, I've played at the national level at about 35 times captain the state team multiple times so um yeah, you're right. I have a little bit of a rich history back here when it comes to being a player. But uh, eventually I transitioned from being a player into being an events manager because um, what I saw was the boys had more tournaments, the men had more opportunities versus the women. So... I thought, okay, I will create my own events. I will put together some tournaments for women and men. Just adding to the number of tournaments uh, a women player can play in India. So I started there and then uh, I got recognized for my work and uh, the Basketball Federation of India asked me to uh, put together some volunteers and run uh, the FIBA operations to a certain extent and I took that up. The very first FIBA event I did, it hit me. Everybody I was working with lacked uh, classroom knowledge. I don't think it's emphasized enough because if you go into anything untrained, then you do what you've seen. You don't do what is necessary. You just do what you've seen, right? So um, I realized that education, especially sport management education, uh, was the deeper hole that I saw in uh, the Indian sport industry. And then I realized I, I saw teams from New Zealand, teams from Australia, teams from like, um, the southern part of Asia come together um, and I saw that the people I would work I was working with are good extraordinarily good but only thing that was lacking was they were not trained and so they were not doing things right they were th doing things how they see fit mm. so and then I uh, then I started looking for sport management education in India where I can improve my knowledge and to my surprise we Back then, four years ago, even today, have only seven uh, programs across the country. We are the second largest populated country in the world and we have only seven sport management programs. And these are just flavors, not like a full solid sport management program. So then I moved to the United States to get my master's and PhD. And... Uh, I'm still thinking about how I can incorporate sport management education into India, either through ATSI or 
somewhere at some point where classroom education becomes a priority for any industry professional enters the industry. So that's a long term goal. What I thought was really interesting about your story is that um, you had had to learn a number of languages. Is that right? In order for yes. you to succeed in what you do. Tell us about that. So, uh, like I said, I've played 35 times at the national level, 13 years of playing basketball. Um I keep telling this to my friends back in the United States where how time zone changes in the United States, like we have uh, a different language being spoken every hundred miles. So if you if you cannot learn multiple languages, communication becomes really, really hard, especially when you're a captain of some team with with individuals speaking different languages, you better learn the language or teach them a common language. Otherwise, playing as a team becomes a challenge. So uh, I can speak eight different languages and uh, kind of learned it because of basketball. And then um, uh, English is a common language, but not everybody can speak English while they play. A lot of women especially come from remote areas of the nation and where uh, basketball is their only way of education. So it... it it's very different when you play basketball in India because you have to learn different languages to be a basketball player. Not not like they have to learn, but if you learn basketball, I mean, if you learn uh, different uh, languages, you can be a better basketball player. So that's another added skill that you have to learn to be outstanding. And, and you know, that's so different than the United States because, you know, language is not even relevant in, yeah. in, in the U.S. basketball. But there's something else that's kind of interesting in the U.S., when you do anything sport-wise, you have to sign a liability waiver to participate mm -hmm. whether whatever area. In India, does anyone sign a liability waiver? See, the, these are, uh, these are um, some things that classroom learning that I was talking about earlier bring to the picture. No, we don't. At least, to the best of my knowledge, lately, few of the uh, event managers have made it a priority to sign the liability waivers or get it signed by the players who are participating or or um, the players just being uh, sensible about what these liability waivers are like if i walk into if i walk into a a, a college tournament that's being organized somewhere in my locality and ask did you sign a liability waiver they will be like what is a liability waiver right Right. So um, some places have installed this entire process of liability waiver, just being cautious about everything that goes into the system and things like that. But I would say 90 percent is still on the no, no side. They don't know where it like what it means and things like that. And um again, all this is taught to event managers when they go to school and learn from it. So, yeah, no, it's very different in the States. It's way more organized, but in India, we have everything. It just needs to be organized. Sure. And you also have some other um, entities as well. You, I understand you have a sports event management staffing company. Is that right? Mm -hmm. oh, yes. So, so what we do is we identify uh, people who are interested in sports, but since due to lack of opportunities, they pursue different careers. What we do is we create a platform uh we create a platform where they can volunteer their time in different sporting events. So we act as uh, a, a, a pipeline where people can sign up with us and then they can be volunteers at certain sporting uh, events. So uh, in this pipeline, we I kind of make it my mission to you know give them the basic education that they need before they enter the industry. So, and that's a a little form of my knowledge sharing. And then uh, we staff a lot of people like that into the events. Do you have to vet those people who are volunteers or or hired, uh, especially if they're working with youth? Yes. Um, so when I worked for the FIBA event uh, and when ATSI was approached to, you know, uh, staff about 250 people, I went to different universities, different organizations to vet these people, right? 
but uh, I had to interview multiple people ju just before picking. Mm. But uh, at some point, you know, people don't bet. They pick anybody who's available. And in terms of uh, uh, vetting people, the, the eligibility criteria, there's no eligibility criteria. Okay, you're interested, come let, let's... <laughs> Like, let's take you in types. But uh, I understand the need for vetting, especially when you work with the youth. Um, in my case, what we did is we interviewed people. We asked for reference. So somebody had to refer them. They cannot be walking in for and talking for themselves. So it can either be your physical education teacher. It can be your principal. It can be your supervisor who have to tell us about you before we get you in. But that was a very basic step of background check, but that is the least we could do here. But now yeah. things are moving the corporate way where people are getting background check done before they work with youth. But again, 90% is still not there yet. And I understand you've been doing some coaching in the US. Let's uh, show the pictures and why don't you, as we show them, tell us about it. Sure. Um, so this is my boys team in the United States where I work with Coach Kia Whitley. Um, um, this is the Lace Em Up organization and this is my eighth grader team. Uh, one of the best teams in Harrisonburg, Virginia areas. Uh, I Till today, we, there's no single tournament that we haven't reached the finals. So I'm trying to implement some of the Indian coaching methodologies in the United States and it's working wonders for me. So yeah, I think I'll keep that going. <laughs> um, these are a, an amazing bunch of kids that I take pride in. And this is my girls team. Um, my first team that I coached in the United States, uh, proudly the strict champions of the 2022-23 season, uh, Thomas Harrison Middle School, again in the Harrisonburg, Virginia area in the United States, where I've been working with them for a few months now, and uh, we've accomplished quite a bit. And what what uh, tricks do you have or techniques you use in India that are helpful in the U.S.? Well, here's the thing. Um, I am very, very friendly as a coach, but I don't become their friend instantly. So I have a certain line drawn between me and my players. And when I speak, they listen. I make them listen because these kids get distracted easily. And uh, there has to be someone who has to be bossy with them, but also their best friend. So finding that balance as a coach in between, I think, is my um, drum card skill as a coach. All right. So, um, tell us about this picture. So um, the beauty about James Madison uh, is that they create a, an outside classroom uh, uh, teaching methodology. And this is our experiential learning trip to the final four, um, women's final four in Dallas that happened in the month of March, uh, where I, along with another professor, uh, Dr. Hallman, we both put together a program where we took students to Dallas to work as volunteers. Uh, so I believe, and I'm sure most of the professors in my industry understand this, that one event like this can teach a student what we teach an entire semester. So they get hands-on experience with multiple professionals and they really see what goes into an event. So as much as I can teach out of a textbook, I can only talk to them. But experiential learnings like this teach them a lot, like in 24 hours or th this particular event was for about, was for about a week. But um, uh, the students did get to learn a lot. So this is an experiential learning uh, trip to Dallas. And I think uh, I enjoy teaching students like this versus just in the classroom. So as a, a professor at James Madison University in Virginia, what do you teach? I teach um, event and facility management. That's my favorite to teach. And I think uh, since uh, I have that kind of experience in the industry, I can talk through experience and teach better. But uh, I also teach... Uh, a lot of practicum classes, introduction to sport management. Back in Texas Women's University, where I got my uh, MS, PhD, I've taught a little bit of sports law, but a lot of sports governance, international sports. Um, I've also taught uh, women health. Uh, those are some of the areas that I cover when I teach. 
Okay. And so we recently went to the uh, World Association of Sports Management um, conference in uh, Doha, Qatar. Mm -hmm. What was what was your poster presentation shown in in this picture? Uh, so this is about sport management research in India and the need for it, the the absence of it, and um, um, how I was one of the very, very few Indian research scholars who were presenting at the World Association of Sport Management for the very first time. So uh, I was just trying to put India on the world map there. Fantastic. And then let's show some of the other pictures there. That's... Um... That's you at the Olympic Center um, uh, posing uh, in front of the uh, the Wasm, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and uh, let's show we 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 went all around the country to see mm -hmm. every FIFA World Cup stadium, and right. so here is our group, um, three professors at James Madison University and myself. Um, and do you remember what stadium that was? I can't remember. <laughs> It was one of the first ones that we went to. Um, no, we went about eight stadiums that day. So if you ask me which one was which, uh, um, I need to do my research on that. Yeah, I, I I can't remember either. And so let's show the pictures on the Cornish with. Uh, oh, that was at one of the stadiums. That one looked mm -hmm. like like cheese. That stadium. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, we had our own names for those stadiums. Remember. Right, exactly. And then then there's that one on the Cornish with you and the sign as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is in Doha. And yeah, there we go. Um, oh, I love this moment. Yeah, yeah, we really enjoyed that. But anyway, um, Sandhya, thank you so much for being my guest today. I hope everyone learned a little bit more about um, sports in India and basketball in India. I hope so too. And thank you for having me. Uh, it's it's an honor and I hope um, this reaches many people and I can be a little bit informative to anybody who sees this show and good luck for y'all and thank you for being great. All right. Anyway, um, yeah, Sandhya is such an inspirational person, but thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.